get started. I'm, I'm Steve Martyr. It's my uh, privilege to introduce a uh, longtime colleague and friend who I view as really one of the uh, visionary researchers in the area of uh, neurodevelopment and, um, uh, and, and psychosis. Uh, Pam Carter, uh, uh, as you'll see as soon as he speaks, is Australian. He was educated at the University of Western Australia, did his residency at UC Davis, spent time uh, after that at the University of Pittsburgh, and for quite a while has been at 16 years. He's been at uh, UC Davis where he is head of the imaging center, uh, sort of leads a uh, early psychosis program, uh, is head of a uh, behavioral health center of excellence, and uh, he's a man of, of enormous breadth. Uh, I think that many kind of neuropsychologists think that you're primarily a neuropsychologist, and imagers think you're primarily an imager, and I know that you're a psychiatrist. Uh, uh, over the years, he's done work that's extraordinarily elegant, combining different modalities, uh, behavioral paradigms, uh, neuroimaging, uh, electrophysiology, to address really fundamental questions about uh, brain circuitry in uh, healthy and abnormal in individuals. Uh, I'm very much looking, I always look forward to his speaking, and I won't take much more of your time. He's currently a, uh, a, a professor at the uh, University of California in at Davis. Thanks. Well, thank you, Steve, for that very kind introduction. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, to, uh, to be here and to present at Grand Rounds again at UCLA. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about psychotic illnesses. Um, you know, uh, we have a, uh, as Steve mentioned, the EDAP clinic, an, an early psychosis coordinated specialty care program at UC Davis that we're very proud of. It's a large program. We have a contract with Sacramento County that allows us to provide a rich range of services to any young person who's uh, either at risk or developing uh, signs of a psychotic illness. And uh, it was quite discouraging for me to do an analysis about a year ago of outcomes in our clinic. It's something that we tracked, but we did a systematic analysis and uh, we found that over 40% of the people coming through our program, and these are young people who have fairly short durations of untreated psychosis, um, we offer them uh, uh, comprehensive assessments, clinical assessments. Um, we offer them um, state-of-the-art psychopharmacology, uh, a rich range of psychotherapies, uh, recovery services, including case management, supported education, supported employment. And yet, 40% of them don't have a significant improvement in symptoms over the course of a year of this treatment. And so this tells us that we have some work to do still we obviously want to provide these services to young people and to try to get them the best outcomes that we possibly have. But if we're gonna do better than 60%, then uh, I think we need to answer some fundamental questions. And that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll be talking about research that we've been doing uh, at UC Davis that focuses on these questions. When does schizophrenia start? And you can do a uh, search and replace and put psychosis there if you prefer. Um, because most of the, um, the clinical data that I'll show you relating to changes in cognition, changes in functional circuitry uh, in schizophrenia also apply to individuals with bipolar disorder with psychotic features. Uh, what goes wrong and why and what can we do about it? I think I'm probably not really gonna get to this last uh, question, uh, but, um, but, but perhaps we can have a conversation about it later. So um, I'm gonna start by showing this photo of Emil Kraepelin. For one thing, he's got the most superb beard. Um, um, but I also show it to highlight the perspective on schizophrenia that I was trained uh, to, to embrace, which was that schizophrenia was this neurodevelopmental disorder. 
Now, I have been accused of, um, in my focus on neurodevelopment, of using Kraepelin as a sort of straw man because I think you know, most of the field now thinks about schizophrenia as being a neurodevelopmental disorder, but, but not entirely. I was on a phone conference a couple of weeks ago with Steve and uh, a group of um, uh, psychiatric neuroscientists around the country, and the leader of that phone call actually laid out two alternative theories. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder, it's a neurodegenerative disorder, and so I think there is still a lot of thinking. I think it's also probably fair to say that um, there's really a continuum of development, and so it's possible that uh, you know changes in brain development can play out later in life, and one can see those as being perhaps akin to neurodegeneration, whereas in fact they really reflect the consequences of altered neurodevelopment. There's a, a lot of literature um, providing compelling evidence that there are signs of changes in behavior, um, emotional expression, and cognition in young people uh, many, many years before they develop psychosis. So um, many of us in the room are familiar with the work that Elaine Walker has done over the decades. In 1990, she published this uh, paper in the American Journal of Psychiatry where she um, had raters observe uh, home videos of birthday parties of children. And with a little bit of training, the raters were actually very good at picking out the young people who were more likely to go on and develop schizophrenia than those who were not. And these were primarily um, uh, observable changes in motor behavior and emotional expression that were correlated with this prediction. Um, there are a lot of uh, prospective studies that uh, support the notion that uh, schizophrenia or the processes associated with schizophrenia are evident, at least in many people who later develop the illness early in life. The Dunedin cohort is a very well-known cohort study um, that uh, has uh, been ongoing since uh, 1972. There's a little bit over a thousand people who've been followed and undergone evaluation starting at age three. Those evaluations are of a wide range of different sort of phenotypic characteristics. And uh, people have looked back at that data uh, to ask the question, is there evidence of changes in uh, behavior, cognition, uh, achievement in young people in early age who later go on to develop psychosis, as well as other psychiatric syndromes? Um, this, is, uh, this is one of those studies. And uh, it's very interesting because uh, these are uh, basically uh, scores of uh, motor performance. Um, you have uh, healthy control individuals, people who later on went on to develop anxiety and depression, people who went on to develop bipolar disorder, and then here you have the young people who went on to develop schizophrenia. And you can see at ages three and five, those young people are actually performing at a lower level than the other groups. This group also looked at measures of psychopathology um, and uh, using the child behavior uh, checklist. And they also showed that compared to healthy subjects, young people who went on to develop Psychopathology general, generally showed increased internalizing uh, uh, problems starting at age five, and um, externalizing problems uh, uh, associated with bipolar, this later, later development of bipolar illness and uh, schizophrenia, also starting very early in life at age five. There's uh, another study that I really like. Um, it was conducted by somebody called Robert Builder. Has anybody heard of him around here? Um, so uh, Bob did this study when he was at Hillside Hospital, and this was a follow-back study. So what he did was he identified a group of children who, uh, and he, he, he uh, got access to their uh, school achievement records. And he looked back and showed that uh, compared to uh, a control group, young people who uh, ultimately did not develop a psychotic illness, the young people in their first episode psychosis study for whom they could identify those school records consistently achieved at a lower level, roughly one year's grade level, compared to people who uh, did not develop a psychotic illness. And this is kind of, a, looks like a straight line to me. Um, I think technically the slopes are slightly different, so there was a, an interpretation of these results that possibly uh, this gap was widening um, in adolescence. But certainly what's striking is the evidence that um, these individuals who are destined to develop a psychotic illness were showing signs of reduced achievement at an early age, going back to the first grade. 
And then uh, I won't show the details of this, but similar work has been reported in the Dunedin cohort. There's actually a whole body of literature that makes this point. So uh, in some of our clinical neuroscience research at Davis, we've tried to answer um, a few questions. Um, so what's the developmental trajectory of cognitive and neural biomarkers in schizophrenia? Do they progress over the early course of the illness? Surprisingly, we don't really know this. Um, and uh, and um, uh, I just wanted to kind of show this summary side, slide of, 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 of what some of those biomarkers are. Um, these are actually not biomarkers, these are post-mortem markers. Um, but uh, people uh, who uh, have schizophrenia compared to healthy controls have changes, reduction in the numbers of PV bas basket cells inhibitory into neurons that form critical elements um, in local circuits in the cortex. This is seen most markedly in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but it's seen in multiple areas of the brain. And um, in uh, electrophysiology and modeling studies in animal model systems, it's associated with a disruption in oscillatory activity in, in local circuits that's important for supporting healthy brain function and cognition. People with schizophrenia also show uh, reduced numbers of synaptic spines, the sort of um, uh, neural level alteration in connectivity compared to healthy controls. Um, we can measure uh, related processes in uh, people with the illness using non-invasive methods. So uh, uh, structural MRI studies uh, consistently show small and quite localized changes in cortical thickness in young people with schizophrenia. These studies are a little bit complicated by the fact that antipsychotic drugs also change cortical volumes and thickness. So we aren't 100% sure how much of this is due to medication treatment and how much of it is due to um, uh, the illness itself. Um, it is worth noting, though, that these changes, particularly early in the course of illness, are very localized. Um, we can measure oscillatory activity uh, using EEG, and people with schizophrenia show reductions in oscillat activ oscillatory activity, particularly in the gamma and theta bands, um, during uh, rest, during situations where the brain's being entrained by stimuli, as well as associated with various forms of cognition. Using fMRI, we can uh, look at the circuitry that's associated with higher cognition, a process that um, uh, uh, we focused on called cognitive control. And people with schizophrenia are unable to uh, activate to the same degree the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and an associated circuitry that includes the parietal cortex and premotor areas. And you see changes in both activation and connectivity. I'll show you a little bit of data on that in a moment. And then um, another um, very important and consistent finding in schizophrenia and psychosis in general is that people with psychosis have increased dopamine synthesis and release in the striatum. And uh, this is predictive of their psychotic symptoms and the likelihood that they'll respond to uh, dopamine blocking drugs. So this is a, a, an early study that we did uh, in our early psychosis patients in Sacramento. Um, we gave the patients a cognitive control task to uh, do in the scanner. Cognitive control is a, a psychological construct that involves maintaining contextual information in order to overcome habitual responding. And we found that changes in activation and changes in connectivity uh, in the patient group were associated with poorer cognition, uh, clinical measures of disorganization, and also levels of functioning. And this uh, sort of prefrontal uh, cognitive control related uh, disorganization sy syndrome is something that we've seen in a series of studies over the years. And it's seen both in bipolar disorder with psychotic features as well as in people with a schizophrenia or schizophrenia spectrum diagnosis. It's clinically relevant. Um, this paper was just recently published, and uh, we were talking about predictive analytics. This is a pretty simple predictive analytic. This is a logistical regression analysis, looking at the relationship between activation in that frontal parietal cortex and a treatment response after a year of coordinated specialty care. And what we saw in this study was that um, on admission, the people who weren't as good at getting this network to work during uh, cognitive control had poorer clinical outcomes. They were that 40% that didn't do well after 12 months of uh, fairly uh, intensive treatment. I mentioned that we don't really know what happens uh, in the early course of the illness to cognition and brain activation. Using that same experimental paradigm, we're able to scan a group of patients um, uh, at a, you know, a variable number of times, um, up to three years after this initial presentation in the clinic. And we were interested in two questions. One is, uh, if you have an early onset of the illness, if you're young when you develop psychosis, do you have a worse outcome? There's certainly literature that suggests that that's the same. And then the second question is, what happens over the course of the illness? Do people have a functional decline after they present 
um, and into treatment or, uh, or not. So we got fairly clear answers to both of those questions. First of all, with regard to age, for both the behavioral measure, the cognitive performance measure, as well as uh, activation in the prefrontal cortex, there really was not an effect in terms of that interaction between age and onset and the difference between healthy controls, the deficit between healthy controls and people with schizophrenia. Um, so we didn't see that age of onset effect that, that we might have predicted. Um, but also we saw no evidence whatsoever of um, sort of a widening of the gap um, such that people with schizophrenia um, were impaired when they entered the study, they were impaired at follow-up. That was true for behavior and it was true for the neural activation that's associated with that behavior. And there really wasn't any evidence either of recovery, which is a little disappointing because most of these people were actively participating in fairly high level treatment, but certainly no evidence of deterioration. Um, I think you're probably familiar that there's a clinical risk syndrome. UCLA was one of the early um, sort of pioneers of the concept of the clinical high risk or ultra high risk syndrome and people like Carrie Beard in here are experts in doing those assessments and uh, contributing to that literature. So um, one of Carrie's trainees, Tara Neenden, uh, and uh, the rest of our group uh, did a, a small study uh, using uh, fMRI in the clinical high risk population. And what we saw was that compared to first episode patients, the clinical high risk group, both in terms of behavioral performance, were very similar to the first episode group and uh, impaired compared to healthy controls. And um, this was also true um, uh, in terms of their physiology. So uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortical activation in the high cognitive control condition was significantly reduced both in the clinical high risk and in the first episode group. And then recently, um, we were able to uh, get access to a larger sample of young people who met the high psychosis risk syndrome. Had about 120 young people in this sample. Almost 20, I think 19 of them uh, over the course of a year converted from the risk state to active psychosis. And then of the remaining 100, roughly half of them uh, remitted, uh, no longer met criteria at one year for the psychosis risk syndrome. And uh, the other half continued to meet criteria. So they're kind of what we call persistence. So when we look, and unfortunately we don't have imaging data on this particular cohort, but we have the AXCPT D prime context cognitive control behavioral measure that I talked about. And what we saw was a, a near miss with regard to a group differences in performance in this sample. Um, the clinical high risk, uh, I should say the converters compared to the non-converters were almost significantly more impaired. Um, but when we compared the three groups, what we saw was systematic differences between the uh, rem remitters who were most like the controls, the persisters who continue to meet criteria for the clinical high risk syndrome by virtue of having persistent attenuated positive symptoms and the converters worst of them all. And then um, when we uh, used what's called a risk calculator um, where we combine the cognitive measure with uh, two clinical measures, um, two items from the SIPs P1 and P2, so suspiciousness and unusual thought content, uh, age, because in this syndrome, younger age in most samples is associated with less likelihood of converting. And also, um, uh, there two, two kinds of functional scores. We saw that um, the prediction was actually pretty good. So for conversion, it was about just a little bit over 70%. And uh, when we ran the model and we tried to separate out the three groups, we were actually uh, able to classify people at almost 80%. Um, others have reported the risk calculator using different kinds of cognitive measures. Um, the AXCPT has certain advantages by virtue of the fact that it's brief to administer about 10 minutes, it's run on a computer, it doesn't require special training, and it's associated with a specific neural system. All right, so just to summarize this part, the clinical part of the talk, um, schizophrenia cognitive pathology is present early in life. Um, the cognitive and related neural circuitry deficits are already established in the prodrome and they may not progress, at least not in the early course of the illness. They don't improve either. And the question is, what is the underlying neurobiology? So if we were to actually understand um, the causes of this developmental pathology, we might be in a better position 
to intervene at the right time, to have the biomarkers we need to identify those that are at risk or to uh, personalize treatment, and perhaps a better understanding of the molecular biology of the illness that would allow us to uh, develop new therapies. And to this end, uh, we have for the last four years been uh, pursuing these questions as part of a Conti Center that we have at UC Davis. And um, the motivation for this is that uh, there's been a growing sort of neurobiology of um, new immune mechanisms. Uh, going back, I think, initially to Carla Schatz's work at Stanford that has suggested that the immune system and um, molecules associated with it, MHC, cytokines, and others, play a very critical role in brain development and maintenance of healthy synaptic functioning. Um, uh, there's also very interesting epidemiology, as you all know. Uh, the most robust um, uh, non-genetic risk factor for schizophrenia is maternal infections. Um, going back into initial reports of maternal influenza uh, conveying uh, increased risk, and more recent studies from Alan Brown and others showing that uh, maternal infections for both schizophrenia and, and um, bipolar disorder show, uh, convey uh, about a five to seven fold r increased risk for developing the illness, which is much, much larger than any genetic risk factor that we know about. Uh, we also can measure altered immune molecules in uh, the plasma of people with psychosis and schizophrenia, and some of these seem to be kind of persistently increased, uh, and some of them appear to be increased in a state-related way. I will say that um, these same molecules are often increased in other mental disorders, including mood disorders and eating disorders, so PTSD, so it's hard to know how specific they are, but it is a reliable finding, and, and we, we, have, we have seen this in our patients in Sacramento. And then coming back to genetics, um, uh, this is the 108 uh, uh, risk genes. I guess the number is up to over 200 now. Uh, but it's very interesting to look at this so-called Manhattan plot because there's one outlier here, and that's the, uh, a gene that's linked to the uh, major histocompatibility complex. Why would that be so increased in, uh, in schizophrenia? There is some uh, evidence from clinical trials, and uh, um, uh, I'm not sure if Stephen worked in this area or not, but um, there are several uh, uh, reasonably well-controlled studies that show that, at least in subsets of patients, uh, drugs that have anti-inflammatory actions do cause improvements in symptoms in patients with psychosis. And, uh, and particularly interestingly, and how this, uh, how this Conti Center was sort of born, um, there are, uh, since the mid-2000s, uh, interesting animal model systems that involve maternal immune activation. This was uh, pioneered by Paul, the late Paul Patterson at Caltech. Um, essentially, these, are, these were initially mouse models uh, where uh, a mouse uh, underwent injection with a um, synthetic RNA, poly-IC, at a certain point in pregnancy, generally the transition between first and second trimester. And that mouse would develop some evidence of illness and uh, a cytokine response and then would get better, uh, would deliver pups normally, and those pups would be relatively typically developing mouse pups until they... Uh, went through late childhood, early adolescence, and then they would develop various experimental phenotypes that uh, mouse biologists and others associate with uh, psychosis. These include behavioral phenotypes, uh, such as sensory motor gating and working memory impairments, changes in social behavior, uh, increased sensitivity to dopamine agonists, and changes in uh, cortical gray matter, and also um, those interneurons that we talked about earlier. And uh, the center actually was, uh, was born um, as part of a random conversation. Uh, I, I was uh, teaching a class to our graduate students on the neuroscience of mental disorders, and uh, we had some people who worked in autism come to give a presentation, and one of them was my colleague Kimberly McAllister, who's done a lot of work in the mouse model, and David Amaral and Melissa Bauman, who were also gonna teach in that class, started talking about their monkey maternal immune activation pilot study and how the monkeys were getting very behaviorally disturbed. And that got my attention and uh, the group of us started to talk. And uh, as is often the case, we got some initial investment from our university and were able to collect enough pilot data to successfully compete for the Conti Center. 
We have four projects, one of which is based here at UCLA. Um, the first is a, essentially a mouse biology project I uh, described to you, uh, led by Kim McAllister. Uh, the second is led by Dan Geshwood, actually, here at UCLA. It's a transcriptomic study looking at transcripts from the mouse model, the monkey model, and also human postmortem brains. Uh, the third is a, an imaging uh, uh, project uh, that's using MRI-based imaging to look at brain structure and uh, function in the non-human primate model. And then the fourth is uh, uh, a molecular imaging study that involves uh, um, some data that I'll show you in a moment that's being conducted in both monkeys and humans. So the key, uh, um, and so this little subset of the Conti is what I'll talk about for the rest of the talk, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions and how this all fits together. So uh, what is particularly intriguing is the ability in this study to do parallel imaging across species, and we're primarily focusing on the non-human primate and the human. Uh, we're doing structural and functional imaging, diffusion-weighted imaging of estimated free water and magnetic resonance spectroscopy measures of glutathione. I'll tell you why we're doing all that in a minute. Um, we're doing this in both the maternal immune activation, non-human primates, humans with schizophrenia, and um, appropriate controls. Uh, in the monkey, we're also doing FMT PET imaging. And uh, in the monkey, we're doing this study we can't do in humans. So I spent a lot of time brainstorming with Steve about how we need a really long-term, longitudinal study of people with risk, where we, where we collect biomarker information and follow their clinical trajectories. We can't do that in humans, but in the non-human primate model, we're able to do this. So we start scanning uh, actually at three months of age, and we'll continue during, during the life of the grant and into adolescence in the life of the non-human primate model. So I'll show you first some uh, results in uh, young people with schizophrenia. Um, so uh, the, fr the free water imaging is a diffusion method that allows you to separate the um, uh, uh, water that's in cells from the water that's in the extracellular space. It's a somewhat crude measure. Um, you have to be very careful methodologically um, in terms of the acquisition and the analysis, but it is markedly increased in known models of brain inflammation. And um, in this particular study, in order to help uh, corroborate its relationship to brain inflammation, we also collected the spectroscopic measure that I'll show you in a moment. Um, but these are the basic results. So. Uh, in uh, uh, whole gray matter, in the young people with schizophrenia, there was a significant increase in the free water signal, something that had been reported before in more chronically ill patients, um, uh, and uh, uh, not in the white matter in this particular study. Uh, this is the distribution, the cortical distribution, so it is somewhat focal to frontal and temporal areas, not that dissimilar from uh, the map that I showed you from the Fusapoli meta-analysis about changes in, in brain structure in the illness. Um, we use glutathione spectroscopy um, as a way to uh, increase our sensitivity to brain inflammation. Glutathione is an antioxidant um, in the presence of free radicals um, uh, glutathione levels uh, decrease. Uh, we did not see a decrease in the schizophrenia group. It may be the case that you need a 7T scanner to see that. It seems like the most convincing studies that show decreased uh, glutathione um, in schizophrenia are done on 7Ts. But what we did see, very interestingly, and actually as predicted by my collaborator, Rick Maddock, was that we would see a negative correlation between free water and GSH, suggesting that the people with the high free water had the lowest GSH providing some support to the interpretation that this is a neuroimmune or neuroinflammatory process. So I mentioned this non-human primate model. Um, uh, we had joined forces with the group that developed this model, um, which was also done in collaboration with Paul Patterson. Um, uh, there was a small pilot cohort, and what's interesting about these animals was that, like the mouse model, they were pretty typically developing both physically, socially, and uh, you know, in terms of other observable behaviors uh, early in life, but as they entered adolescence, they developed so altered social behaviors um, and uh, repetitive behaviors, and in some cases, self-injurious behaviors. Um, we, uh, we got some initial funding, as I mentioned, uh, internal funding at UC Davis uh, to, uh, to do some work on these animals, and I managed to convince my colleagues that what we could do if we really wanted to relate this to psychosis was to do uh, PET imaging of subcortical dopamine. And I'm happy to say they believe me. 
and uh, they were convinced. And uh, these are the results from that study. It's a small study, uh, but I think you know it's always nice when you can see the results. And uh, we saw a quite robust increase in um, uh, the uh, the marker of uh, dopamine synthesis capacity in the poly IC animals uh, compared to the control animals in that study. And that was all kind of just the lead up uh, to the current study where we have a new cohort of uh, 14 MIA treated non-human primates and 14 controls. Uh, we only studied males. Um, you're allowed to do that with non-human primate research. You can't do that with human research anymore. Uh, we did that for two reasons. One is the cost and ethics of doing non-human primate research and wanting to minimize the sample size and uh, the fact that uh, the, the, the male phenotype of psychosis is, is more severe than the female phenotype. So um, I have uh, two years of data to show you. We're just analyzing year three data. So we've scanned these monkeys. We scanned them at three months, but uh, the anatomical data at three months were not really uh, even we were collaborating with someone called Martin Steiner at UNC, who's sort of one of the experts in the world in segmenting um, uh, 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 infant brains, and we haven't been able to uh, get the kind of seg registration and segmentation that we would want to stand by with the three-month-old monkey. So I'll show you data from six months to two years. But first, a bit about the actual uh, animals themselves. Um, so these are sort of various behaviors that these animals uh, showed as infants. Um, these are their weight and height, and I think you can see they're pretty much comparable to, uh, to the, to the uh, saline treated animals. Um, and um, these are interactions with the mother, which aren't different. Um, some other neurodevelopmental models, one of the most striking things is you see changes in the interaction with the mother. Um, and uh, as you can see here, um, uh, okay, this is the same thing. So as I mentioned, um, we've done uh, longitudinal uh, structural imaging, free water imaging, and pet imaging in this model. Um, this basically <laughs> complicated uh, table here um, shows you that in the initial regions of interest that we examined, frontal, prefrontal, cingulate, and temporolimbic, um, uh, the frontal and prefrontal areas showed a main effect of decreased volumes. I'll show you the data in a moment. Uh, the cingulate, a trend towards that, and uh, temporal limbic, not at all. So selective change. Um, this is uh, the left and right frontal and prefrontal areas. And I think what you can see is that at six months of age, the poly IC monkeys already have changes in the anatomy of the frontal lobes and prefrontal lobes. And interestingly, although there are some developmental trends, um, kind of like in our fMRI data, I didn't comment on that. You know, what's interesting in our fMRI data are how the people with, young people with psychosis are also improving um, uh, cognitively uh, at the same rate as healthy people even after they become ill. So these non-human primates show of this very early signal, um, and it's, it's pretty stable across the first two years of life in the context of normal. And then uh, with regard to the free water results, um, we see at a trend level uh, increases in gray whole gray matter free water, um, and we do see a significant increase in the anterior cingulate. And then the dopamine measures. So uh, at 12 months, there's no difference between the um, poly IC monkeys and the, treated, and the saline treated control monkeys. At um, 24 months, they're actually interestingly starting to separate so developmentally, we're seeing a decrease in the healthy, uh, non-treated animals and an increase. This is actually, although it looks statistically significant to me, I am told unequivocally by my statistical consultant it is not significant. And when you look at the data, it's very variable from animal to animal, which I think probably explains why that's the case. Um, we're obviously very interested now. We've completed the three-year scanning, and we're very interested in doing the three-year analysis in this animal model. All right. So. Um, this is good. I'm going to have time to uh, to take questions. So, what can we take from this? So, I think um, I think one thing that that uh, is clear is consistent with the existing literature, and I think confirmed by our own studies uh, that include imaging, is that cognitive pathology associated with psychosis precedes other signs of psychosis onset by many years in, in individuals who are destined for psychosis. 
that poor prefrontal uh, functioning is a negative predictor of clinical outcomes, and that's true in clinical high risk, and it's true in people presenting for care in an early psychosis program. Um, and then the non-human human maternal immune activation is a very intriguing model for late onset atypical development, sort of psychosis risk model, we would argue. Um, the, the imaging studies are interesting in that we don't see progression, we see sort of fixed deficits, brain structure and function, and importantly, these are being observed in, in, in the equivalent of many years ahead of uh, any expected changes in the behavior of these monkeys. We, in the pilot cohort, saw hemonergia, increased uh, striatal dopamine synthesis capacity, which is a molecular biomarker for psychosis. And um, as I said, the animals are just finishing their three-year studies. They're undergoing intensive, in extensive social and cognitive testing. We do see a little bit of a cognitive signal um, in, the, in the treated animals. It's, it's quite subtle. It's on one more complex cognitive task. These monkeys are actually uh, and we see a little bit of a signal, but no gross behavioral evidence uh, of the treatment. And what I haven't shown you, um, because it's ongoing, is that there are previous cohorts from mouse work in the center, uh, uh, an extensive amount of cellular and, um, and molecular analyses ongoing. Uh, and again, I there are some interesting changes in uh, neuronal morphology, and there are some interesting changes in the expression of some genes associated with immune function in those animals. So um, I want to uh, first show you the, the large team of people that are uh, working on uh, the Conti work, both in human subjects uh, non-human primates and mice, and also uh, my team, Imaging Research in Sacramento, and I'll thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to say uh, we still have plenty of time for questions. Hi, Ken. Hi, Susan. Um, so you probably know because it's very a big thing at Davis that the uh, maternal immune model is also a model of autism. It is, and um, so I was wondering, um, and of course this you know this you know complementary genetic risk as well as something that is a resurging um, uh, concept in autism and schizophrenia. My question is, do you have any idea why um, this would affect some animals? early in life to develop autism and others later? Like, why is it autism in some and schizophrenia later? And also, uh, I was wondering if you could comment on some of the behaviors that you might be able to observe, at least in the non-human primates, that make you feel more schizophrenic-like or and maybe autistic-like. Sure. Well, first, I, I think I stand corrected for probably anthropomorphizing the animal models more than I should have. Um, it is true, actually, the entire group that, that uh, did the animal model work are uh, card-carrying autism researchers, and I had to convince them that um, this might be related to an other neurodevelopmental disorders other than autism. Um, and I, I would say that what we're really looking at is a non-human primate and mouse model of atypical development. Um, it might be, uh, uh, you know, it might be a risk syndrome. It might be have some features of a disorder, uh, but I, I, you know, I would I would back off a little bit. Um, I do think that the dopamine finding is really interesting, and um, it's certainly true for both the murine models and the monkey models that, you know, unlike autism, the phenotype isn't obvious when they're really young. Um, so it, you know. We have lots of arguments about what it's a model of. Um, uh, and I, I lean towards thinking it's a, it's a model of adolescent onset, you know, serious mental health risk. Um, in terms of behaviors, so, um, you know, the, the initial pilot cohort, which is what we have to go on with the non So with the mouse, you know, th there's been all sorts of, all sorts of social um, grooming, uh, memory, 
uh, and and you know there's a lot of different uh, impairments that are reported in the literature. Um, the mouse model is also very uh, variable, and it's there are I think technical issues with regard to the actual activation and the reagents that are used. I understand that when you house mice in some environments, they have a different immune response than in another environments, which makes me feel a whole lot better about being a messy human researcher. And um, uh, uh, even within even within a litter, there's quite a bit of variability in terms of the expression. So, uh, in the non-human primate, you know that's part of the part of the reason why, you know, that that is a that is a complex area of research. It's it's arguably you know quite uh, controversial um, I think that there's no question that that one can interrogate cognition and social behavior um, and uh, measure changes in those things in ways that are much more relevant to human pathology than you can in the murine model and that's a big reason why um, we are working in that model and um, and the cognitive testing you know needs to be um, age appropriate that's the challenge um, uh, the, 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 the monkeys grow up quickly, so one year, so we, I showed you data from six months to, to four years, or we will have full, full four years of data. That's basically from two years until about 16 years. And so they grow up quickly, but they need to be provided with age appropriate challenges. So our primate center, um, there are 3,000 uh, rhesus macaque monkeys living in large colonies in the primate center. Um, those uh, the, the center has been characterizing behavior of different kinds since its inception, you know, going back to the, I think the 1970s. Uh, we have a lot of information. I showed you some of the observational uh, information that we have about this particular sample. Um, and we have them, you know, doing increasingly human-like cognitive tasks. So for instance, the first little bit of evidence that there might be a behavioral signal is from a reversal learning task. And the, the, the change that we're seeing isn't that different from what we've seen using a reversal learning task in, uh, in, in patients. Um, of course, the reason that we're doing the reversal learning task isn't that that's the best task or that it's gonna capture some specific deficit. It's what, what they can do when they're two. Um, so um, so we're, we're moving on now to more complex tasks, working memory tasks and memory tasks and collecting those data. Um, that's what we're doing. Yes. Oh, sorry, you're supposed to be running this. Hey, great, great talk, Cam. Um, quick, qu I was really intrigued by the ASCPT results that you show, the predictions, and I was wondering um, if you can get any additional mileage from looking at deviations from parents or siblings on that task as opposed to sort of an absolute value. And if, yeah. Uh, we could if we had that data. Um, unfortunately, uh, we haven't collected that data, but it's a very good idea. Cam, uh, great talk. Could you just speculate on the on the relationship between cognitive con uh, the the slides that you talked about the relationship between cognitive control and the um, ability of patients to reach a remission? Can you speculate on what underlies that? Is it uh, is it the integrity of some kind of circuits or how do, how do you put it together? So those are those are the aims of the of, of a grant that I have to revise and resubmit. Um, <coughs> uh, so I mean the, the link to the circuitry is fairly clear. Um, so you know people with psychosis who do a cognitive control task don't generate the oscillatory activity that we measure that we can measure using EEG that that people who don't have a psychotic illness have. They don't activate the frontal parietal network that supports those psychological functions. Um, uh, and they don't, don't sort of engage the distributed network in a task appropriate way. Um, that doesn't tell you why they didn't do well in treatment. And, and I think you know, there, are, there, are, there are a range of different possibilities that cover, I mean, it's possible. So we, we did control for medication use and it, it, it wasn't different between the good outcome and the bad outcome, or if we put it in as a covariate, it didn't change the results. Um, but it's possible that um, if people, so using contexts means encoding the whole context, and that can be the reasons why I want to recover, um, it can be the reasons to, to participate in treatment, it can be the ability to take advantage of therapeutic interventions like CBT, 
Um, or it's possible from a neural circuitry point of view, you know, one, one uh, hypothesis that we hope to test in this longitudinal study in the non-human primate model is that cortical pathology happens fairly early and that um, at some point you get dysregulated, you know, the there's, you know, the frontal cortex plays a role in regulating midbrain dopamine function, synthesis and release, and at some point that becomes dysregulated. So, so it's possible that if that, that cortical circuitry is more impaired, that there's more uh, dysregulation of the dopamine. So you could come up with a neuro, you know, neurobiological account, you could come up with a psychological account. I think they're both very interesting and it would be uh, you know, interesting to pursue both of those. Hi, Cam. That was Hi. wonderful, super Thanks. interesting. Um, so I'm really intrigued by your findings on the, the free water in, in the humans. I mean, also the animals, but yes. particularly. Uh, so, you know, I mean, with Ofer Pasternak has really shown this kind of trajectory. Well, it's not, you know, it's, it's cross-sectional, but basically where you see this kind of acute, um, well, what, what looks like it may be sort of an acute reaction where you see this elevated free water in first episode, but not in chronic patients. And then uh, the story is even less clear in uh, clinical high risk. And so... I'm curious if you have looked at these other sort of populations by age or phase of illness and or any longitudinal data that might kind of shed light on what's going on there. Well, I w yeah, my take on the existing literature, there's several studies now, um, and uh, I don't think there's a clear story about trajectory, so uh, we need to do uh, some longitudinal studies. You did you do free water in Naples? You, what did you, th so what's the story? Because I haven't seen anything. Yeah, it's complicated. Uh -huh. <laughs> that, come on. <laughs> no, um, well, so, uh, so I, I can, uh, for people who are interested in free water in Naples, I can tell you. So, so essentially, with, uh, for Naples, too, we did not have the multi-shell diffusion um, protocol, oh. which I So you did the estimated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it was it was very inconsistent oh. across sites, and so there were big side effects that kind of overwhelmed signal. Um, so, I I would not say I would not stake any claims on there being a strong uh, signal for extracellular free water in um, clinical high risk. Now, with Naples, did you look 3, at the gray matter as well as the white matter? Because so that's my other. Uh, that was the that's other the thing. Uh, Ofer Ofer doesn't like to look at the gray matter. He loves white matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's the other thing that um, we, s we see the biggest effect in the gray matter. And I think for Naples three, where we do have the same multi-shell protocol that you were using, mm -hmm. um, although you found a trend in white matter too, right? With this we did. Yeah, signal. there was something going on there. Yeah. yeah. So in any case, I will hopefully be able to tell you about that. <laughs> so we've, we've done the estimated as well in two different populations, a Spanish early psychosis population and an older population uh, with a, a, a Davis. And we see the reductions that we see with the multi-shell. And other people who use both methods claim that, that, that actually the results are fairly well correlated. But you have to look at the gray matter, so. Very uh, fascinating talk, Cam. Um, going back to the cognitive control part of the talk, um, if I understand correctly, so cognitive control can, at baseline, can predict um, remission, I guess. For improvement. <coughs> improvement. Um, if I understand correctly, you also have data on, uh, longitudinal data on cognitive control. Does the cognitive control changes over time track with uh, symptomatic changes or more functional changes, or how do you think of those systems as moving together over time? Yeah, they're different. They're slightly different, but slightly overlapping samples. Um, so we haven't gone back and looked at the subgroup. Um, we need to do that. That's a really good suggestion. Um, you know, what, what, what we've, I was initially very disappointed when we got the initial longitudinal results because I thought people were getting better. Um, and uh, this is, I think, a cautionary tale for all of us in this business, you know. Um, uh, and, a, and a lot of people got better sort of from a recovery point of view, but, but for symptoms and recovery point of view, there is this largest group that, that, don't, that don't get better. But I was really hoping that, cog even, at least in the bipolar group, that they would improve at 12 months, and they don't improve at 12 months either. So um, it seems like, you know, now people did not have, we didn't do cognitive training. Um, we
we didn't do neurostimulation. You know, these are all things that I think we, th if anything, this makes an even stronger case for how important all of that is. And exercise, right? Yeah. Two questions. Always good to hear you talk. Very different than we usually <laughs> interact it's around, true. right? <laughs> um, first, is there any information on the effect of that uh, uh, perinatal infection, the, ma the maternal infection, in the, in the context of having or not having a family history of schizophrenia. So do, do we know, is this unleashing a risk factor or is this its own independent risk factor? Yeah, we, we don't know that. I think people are beginning to look at that and I think it would be super helpful to do that. Okay, because that might help clarify the some of yep. the mechanism, right? And yes. then uh, and then what do you, what would you recommend that, y you know, the, the, the psychiatric resident or the psychology intern learn about these kinds of scientific methods, these forms of investigation? What's important so that as data comes out, it's not like, forget it, I can't, what is this? So yeah. what, what kind of education do you do? What would you recommend yeah. for residents? Well, how many residents here? couple, um, few, yeah. Um, yeah, teaching neuroscience to residents. Um, I'm gonna volunteer Dr. Buchheimer, start a new, <laughs> a new class, in, and, and Dr. Bearden. Um, uh, I believe that in 10 years, you know, we're gonna be a, a lot, now we, 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 we need to have a systems perspective. We need to have our empathetic, empathetic skills and our psychotherapeutic skills and our listening skills. We've got to keep all the things that make us uniquely psychiatrists. But I think we're going to be a lot more like neurologists in terms of having access to laboratory measures and tests of different kind. And I think that those will be, those will be quite important um, for personalized medicine, which I think is, is, is going to, one day we you know, in, tw in the last, tw Seemed like, seems like yesterday, but 20 years ago, people said, you can't do fMRI in patients. It'll, you'll never be able to get it to work. You know, there, there'll be no useful clinical information that will ever come out of these measures. I think we, you know, first we can get it to work and it's very reliable and we, you know, it's telling us important clinical information. We have to learn how to use it. Um, there are excellent um, new methods, uh, quantitative methods for taking this information. I didn't show any of this, but that's in the, that's in the revision for the grant that I have to <laughs> resubmit to, to take these data and to make use of them. Um, so, so if a person, you know, if we, if we can, if we could get to 80% prediction for someone coming into the coordinated specialty care program, likely to not do so well. And, it's, and we can relate it to the function of a particular circuitry. We can target that circuitry um, and that might be, um, you know, through some behavioral intervention or cognitive training, or it might be through neurostimulation. Um, if we can predict that someone's likely to be a non-responder, instead of taking one to two years to get them onto clozapine, we can get them more, much more quickly transitioned to clozapine. There's a lot of things we could do with this information if we could just get it a little bit more reliable than it, it seems to be. So, so yeah, in 10 years, I hope that our residents have a good understanding of cognitive science, um, there's plenty of people here at UCLA who can, 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 uh, can teach that. Uh, these non-invasive tools that are really non-invasive and benign and not expensive when you look at the tests that people do in every other area of medicine. Um, and their application in the clinic, which I think we will learn how to do. Um, so they'll, they'll need that training and, and I hope, you know. The residents have a lot to do. Um, they have a very tough job, busy job, um, and my experience is our residents at Davis aren't that enthusiastic for the most part about learning about neuroscience. I think we've got to learn better ways to teach them, make it more interesting and more clinically relevant, but ultimately it's going to be very clinically relevant. We have time for just one more question. Hi, Dr. Carter. Great talk. Thank hey. you. How are you doing? I'm, I'm great. How are great. you? <laughs> I think your picture's still in the... I, uh, yep, yep. I'm, still <laughs> I'm still on there. Um, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about the duration of untreated psychosis findings. So if it's not that the longer people are sick, their deficits are worsening, mm. what is the reason for why after 18 months of untreated psychosis, people sort of just stop responding to treatment? Is it just that those first 18 months, most people tend to get sick in late adolescence and early adulthood, and there's just a lot more neuroplasticity at that time, and therefore they're more amenable to intervention? 
or is it that the longer they're sick, there's a lot of psychosocial ramifications or um, just a lot of other issues that arise that then make it more challenging for them uh, to respond to treatment? Can I choose all of the above? Yes. So I mean, <laughs> and it's, let me say though that in our, in our study, the one that we just published, DEP actually wasn't a predictor. But these people all had pretty short DEPs. Um, and I think people who've been sick for 18 months still can respond to treatment. Um, just at the, at the st statistically, you know, at the population level, having a shorter DEP gives you a better outcome for all of the reasons. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm kind of not a believer in neuroprogression. I think I've tipped my hand there. Um, but I think it's not good for you to be chronically psychotic for many, many reasons and um, makes it harder for you to get back. I like to say we want to keep people on the rails rather than to help get them back on the rails. It's much better to work early on when people are still functioning. As you know, in our clinic, most, most of the young people in our clinic, they're, in, they're going to school, they're working, and they, it, they, things just haven't got to the point where they've started to lose those connections. So that's, that's I think, a lot of what we get from early intervention. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Carter. Great talk. Thanks.